Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the final briefing in our five-part series, What Congress Needs to Know in the Lead-Up to COP26. Today we will look back and present a recap of COP26, key outcomes and what comes next. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. In the lead-up to COP26, EESI devoted the entire month of October to providing briefings and related educational resources with the information and insights that members of Congress and their staff needed. We discussed biodiversity, international climate finance, climate adaptation, and the process the negotiations were expected to follow. Now we're taking a moment to look back and reflect on what happened and what it means for policymakers. I would like to acknowledge our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington, and our great partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, for their support and cooperation that made this briefing series possible. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. ESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. The best way to stay informed about our latest educational resources is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Since the last time we met back on October 22nd for our last briefing, world leaders, diplomats, climate scientists, and stakeholders from across the private and public sectors convened in Glasgow, Scotland for the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, a COP26. It was an intense two weeks, and I know there are differing, differing opinions about what happened and were the announcements updated nationally determined contributions and commitments, where those leave us in the fight to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and avoid the worst outcomes of climate change. While COP26 was underway in Glasgow, policymakers in Washington approved the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and continued debating a potential endgame for the reconciliation package. A lot of the developments uh, in Glasgow and in Washington are related in complicated ways. What do the results of COP26 mean for US policymakers? And what do domestic policies currently being implemented or recently enacted mean in terms of US international climate action commitments? These are two of the bigger questions we are about to try to answer with the help of our four expert panelists. And we'll turn to them in just a moment. One last bit of logistics. Uh, we will have a time for discussion with our panelists, uh, hopefully lots of time for discussion, which is one reason why I'm keeping my introduction so short today. If you have a question, you can share it with us and you have two options to do that. The first is by sending us an email to askask at eesi.org or by following us uh, at eesi online on Twitter. We will do our best to incorporate questions and comments from our online audience into our discussion. And now, without further ado, let us turn to our panel today. Our first speaker is Dr. Simon Evans. Simon is the deputy editor and policy editor for Carbon Brief, a website specializing in climate scientists, climate science and policy. Simon covers climate and energy policy. He holds a PhD in biochemistry from Bristol University. He previously studied chemistry at Oxford University. He worked for the environmental journal The Ends Report for six years, covering topics that included climate science and air pollution. And if you were following COP26 while it happened, chances are you were probably also following Simon because he was extremely active in helping keep everybody up to date as the negotiations were happening. So Simon, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. Hi everyone, thanks Thanks very much for, for the invitation. Um, so I've got 15 minutes, which isn't very long because uh, it was a very, very full two weeks in Glasgow. I'm, I'm still recovering, as I'm sure many others of, of those that were there um, would say the same. Um, so I'm gonna try and cover some of the, you know, the key outcomes from, from COP26 from our perspective. Um, um, I'm just going to go ahead and get the slides going. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to start really with, um, sorry, I'll just get this going. Where are we going? 
Good. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to start really by introducing Carbon Brief, just in case you're not familiar with us. We're we're a kind of we're very privileged as journalists, and um, we're fully grant funded, which means that we can do much longer form journalism. We do a lot of what we call explainer journalism, um, where we we basically take a topic and try and um, you know get into the to the details and do it in a way that's accessible but also very thorough. Um, so everything that we publish is is free. We try and be independent and neutral. Um, and as Dan already said, we cover climate science, climate policy, and also energy, but very much as it relates to climate change. Um, you can see our website on there. Um, and if you want to read more, I think the uh, EESI have already included um, a link to to our summary of the COP in in the in the briefing notes. Um, so I wanted to just start with with the context. I mean, heading into the COP, what we had was effectively an, an enormous ambition gap. So what I'm showing here is a graph from Climate Action Tracker, and you can see in black the black line is the the historical emissions. There's this little blue wedge there, which shows where, where we're headed under um, current pledges and targets. And that was as of September last year. Um, and then the green line shows what would be needed to stay below 1.5 degrees. So there's this very large gap of like something like 25 billion tonnes of emissions in 2030. Now, the problem is for, for the COP that it's this very dry technical process and the COP itself can't deliver uh, higher emissions. Only national governments, you know, businesses, and so on can can do that. Um, so, in a way, like the the climate process is quite detached from from the ambition gap, from the you know the wider public opinion um, activism, and you know, clamour for for greater action towards one point five. So, it had to somehow close this gap off. Um, so, what what I'm going to try and cover in my summary is 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 three things. Um, but first of all, just to step back, um, you know, for many years, you know, we're now onto the 26th COP, and for many years, it, it's been a process of trying to create an international rule-based rule system for managing climate change. Now we have that in, you know, in the Paris Agreement, which was agreed at COP21 in 2015. Um, and so now the, the, the nature of the COP is changing very much from, from a rulemaking body towards one that's much more interested in implementation. And essentially what we're seeing with COP26 is kind of growing pains, I guess you could say, a, a process that's attempting to adapt itself to the reality, you know, so the ambition gap that I showed, and also this, this new kind of global regime under the Paris Agreement. So first of all, I'm going to briefly cover off some of the, the pledges um, that, were, that were made at, in Glasgow at COP26, and those kind of took place outside of the formal negotiations. They weren't really part of um you know the formal agenda but they were put in there they were kind of shoehorned into the agenda by the uk presidency as as one part of its response to you know to that gap between you know the dry technical talks and the reality outside in the outside world um then secondly um the you know i'm going to try and cover the glasgow climate pact now that in itself was quite a novelty um it wasn't on the formal agenda. There wasn't really a, a kind of a mandate for the UK presidency to pursue that, um, which makes it all the more remarkable that they, that they managed to do that. Um, because obviously at COP, everything is agreed by consensus. Um, and then finally, I'm just gonna try very briefly to cover off a couple of highlights in terms of completing the Paris rule book. So what happened uh, in 2015 was that they, you know, they came up with this, with this um, overarching regime but a lot of the details were left to be filled in later. Um, and they have now completely completed that process as of the end of COP26. So, so first of all, just in terms of uh, the pledges, um, so the context for this is that at the heart of the Paris Agreement is this recognition that the initial pledges that countries made in the run up to COP21 were, were massively insufficient to stay, even to stay well below two degrees and certainly for the 1.5 target. So they built into the Paris Agreement this five yearly ratchet, which effectively means every five years, countries are supposed to come back with, with a more ambitious pledge. And then collectively there's a, a stock take to review how we're getting on. Um, 
So the reason that COP26 was seen as particularly important was because it, it is, you know, the fifth COP since uh, since Paris, and countries were supposed to have upgraded their ambition ahead of the meeting. So what we saw was that 151 countries did, in, in fact, do that. Um, so that's, you know, I guess three quarters of the nearly nearly 200 countries that are signed up to the Paris Agreement. And then in addition to that, we saw actually at the COP a whole series of different kind of sectoral initiatives, you know, bilateral announcements, blah, blah, blah. So there were lots of things. I've just highlighted a few of them here. Um, coal was very, you know, it was a, in a way quite a vague commitments that countries signed up to, but nevertheless very significant to see the likes of Indonesia, Vietnam, Poland, um, recognising and starting to talk, talk about the need to phase out coal, albeit some of them with quite a long timeline on that. On deforestation, there was this a Glasgow declaration on ending deforestation by 2030, backed by, I think, something like $17 billion worth of, of investments. And there was also a fact dialogue, which is about um, supply chains for, for commodities that affect um, forest use. And finally, another highlight was the Global Methane Pledge. Again, more than 100 countries signed up to that, pledging to cut their methane emissions collectively by 30% by, um, by 2030. Um, so what we saw with all of that is that um, once you add those, those new pledges to where we were basically a year ago, is some additional ambition that's been added into the mix. So that effectively is the Paris ratchet clunking slowly forwards, doing its job, starting to work. Um, but what you can see is that it, it's only working very, very slowly. So the collectively, those pledges, um, the, you know, the updated NDCs and the new pledges made in Glasgow add up to perhaps only 15 to 20% of, of the gap between where we were headed and what would be needed for 1.5 degrees. So that's kind of the, the pessimistic take on things. I also wanted to, to do kind of zoom out a little bit and give you a slightly, slightly more optimistic perspective. So during, during Glasgow's COP26, we, we published this analysis looking at the temperature um, implications of the different commitments that countries have made. And I've actually added in here in you know, the darkest red on the left hand side, um, before the Paris Agreement, you know, it, 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 was, it was thought at the time that we were heading for something like three and a half or perhaps even four degrees of warming this century, which would have had um, catastrophic consequences. Um, now, since uh, taking into account the pledges that countries had made up to um, the end of last year, we, we kind of got that down with the nationally con uh, determined contributions of all countries, got that down to about 2.6 degrees. Um, then with the, with the, the updated pledges, uh, that was 2.4 degrees. Um, and then the additional coal, methane, deforestation, et cetera, that was another 0.1 degree. So I guess, that, you know, the point of this graph is, um, Two things. First of all, that uh, you know each incremental new bit of ambition is important, even if they're individually small. They they do start adding up, and obviously each fraction of a degree counts in terms of stopping warming and in terms of the impacts that we want to avoid. Um, and the other the other point about this is is just to reflect on on how key it is that that we move not only to from pledges on paper but it, to implementation on the ground, and that's absolutely key, particularly in relation to the longer term net zero commitments that countries are, have been making. So you can see that if, if countries not only meet their 2030 uh, climate pledges under the, the UN process, but also meet their longer term targets to, towards net zero by 2050, 60 and 70, um, then we are getting towards the point, um, again, with full implementation, that's the key caveat, but we're getting towards the point of perhaps being able to keep warming below two degrees. Um, so I'd just like to turn now to um, the Glasgow Climate Pact itself. So as I mentioned, it wasn't, it wasn't formally on, on the agenda. So in a way, it was a risky move by the UK to do this, um, but they obviously, they obviously felt that it was really important to, to do so. One of the things that's quite interesting is the fact that um, in the pact itself, um, the IPCC's findings are really front and centre. Uh, I think that's a real contrast to where we were a few years ago. Um, and I'm going to pull out a few of the, uh, the key features of the pact as we go through. So I'll just flip through the slides to show you. So I just wanted to show you this. This is an extract from the Glasgow Climate Pact itself. And 
you know, reflecting on this, I thought it was really interesting. Looking back to uh, 2018, just three years ago in, in uh, Katowice in Poland at COP24, there was this huge fight that I'm sure many, many of you may remember where um, Saudi Arabia and the US, um, under obviously under the, the Trump administration at the time, um, were battling. Um, there was going to be wording that would welcome the, the special report from the IPCC on, on 1.5 degrees. And it was in some ways very innocuous wording, but became kind of sim uh, uh, symbolic, I suppose, of, of whether or not 1.5 degrees was, was going to be given greater recognition. Um, and so we've moved now from three years ago with that huge fight. Now we've got the special report's findings, very specific details from the special report actually repeated verbatim in the Glasgow Climate Pact. So you can see it's repeating the idea that we need to cut emissions 45% below 2010 levels by 2030. And it's also um, putting a slightly stronger emphasis, I would say, on the 1.5 target relative to, to the text of the Paris Agreement. So that's sort of recognizing the fact that you know the evidence and the science on 1.5 degrees has shown how how much worse it would be if we let warming go beyond that level. Um, so, um, in order to to actually try and you know try and close that huge ambition gap which remains even after that first round of the Paris Ratchet, um, what the Glasgow Climate Pact does is is it requests all parties that you can see it's non-specific language here to revisit and strengthen their targets by the end of next year. Um, now, this, this is quite unexpected. It go, very much goes beyond what was in the Paris Agreement, which was this five yearly ratchet. And we've only just had you know, the first round of the ratchet um, just recently. Um, so agreeing to that is, is quite significant. Um, there was also agreement on loss and damage, a, a dialogue on loss and damage finance. And this had been a key demand of some of the developing countries, AOSIS, the small island states, and, and the, the group of 77 developing countries in China. They'd been pushing for the establishment of a, of a finance facility at, in Glasgow. They didn't get that, but they did get this, this effectively a process to talk about how to deal with this issue. Um, on adaptation, they agreed to have a set up a work program um, to try and work out. Um, so I'm showing here Article 7 of the Paris Agreement. And this said that we would establish a global goal on adaptation um, in the same way that we have a global goal on, on emissions of, uh, sorry, not on, of emissions on, of temperature target of 1.5 and below, below 2 degrees. The problem is that no one's really sure what the global goal on adaptation should look like. So what they did in Glasgow was to set up a work program over the next two years um, to work out what that what that goal should actually be and how we can track progress um, because it's it's really not obvious. Also, they agreed to to at least double adaptation finance from rich countries to poorer countries. Again, a key ask of developing countries before before the summit. Um, this one is is the next one uh, is about the coal fight. So this really dominated a lot of the headlines coming out of, of Glasgow. Um, and you can see here the evolution of the text, um, which started off in the first draft on the 10th of November as accelerating the phase out of coal and subsidies for fossil fuels. And by the end, we had this, this language about the phase down of coal, unabated coal um, and a lot of additional wording about just transition, support for the poorest and so on. I would I would suggest that you know the, the focus on on the fight the fact that India China and others pushed for this this different wording that focus is probably misplaced and the fact that we have for the first time in any COP agreement uh, any COP decision language specifically targeting um, you know fossil fuel and taking action to to limit it you know that that's probably the most significant thing to focus on really. Um, now, finally, um, I've only got a few minutes left uh, before I get buzzed out. So I'm just very quickly going to focus on the rule book. Um, so as I said, this, this was you know, completed now, you know, some, I think we're now, you know, six years af after the Paris Agreement was actually sealed. Um, so I'm just going to pick up two things. One of them is really important. Um, it's this idea of transparency, um, which is effectively about how can you tell that people are doing what they said, you know, the, the basis of the Paris Agreement is uh, pledges that each individual country makes and transparency is vital to make sure that we we can tell are they actually are they living up to those pledges are they you know are their emissions coming down in line, line with their targets are they actually progressing towards the stuff that they promised um, 
So ahead of, uh, no, sorry, actually during the COP, a lot of you may have seen this Washington Post front page. Um, and really, this really highlights the situation, why, the, why this Paris transparency regime is so important. Um, so under the old system, the UN Framework Convention uh, on Climate Change from 1992, um, there were different rules for developed countries versus developing countries and only developed countries had to report their emissions regularly. Um, so you have this situation where, for example, Iran hasn't reported its emissions officially to the UN since 2010, China not since 2014 and so on. Um, so what the new transparency rules you can see in this, in this graphic here, all parties shall, that, that's a, an instruction that they have to do this. All, country, all countries have to report their national emissions and they have to report their progress towards uh, implementing and achieving their, their promises, their nationally determined contributions. So hopefully the idea is we'll, we'll get a much better um, picture of where we are in terms of progress towards um, you know, that, that temperature target. Um, and I should, should mention this, this kicks in from 2024. So from 2024, every two years, all countries will have to do this. And, and then the reports that they put in are subject to, to peer review as well. Um, finally, um, before I finish, just to mention very briefly, uh, another part of the Paris rulebook that was finalized is Article 6. So this is, um, this is about international co cooperation, primarily through carbon markets. So there's Article 6.2, which is bilateral, bilateral cooperation, for example, linked e um, emissions trading systems. There's the Article 6.4, which is an international carbon market to replace the one that we used to have under the Kyoto Protocol. And then there's Article 6.8, which is about non-market cooperation. Um, I don't have much time, so I just wanted to highlight one part of the, the deal that they did in Glasgow, which is about this idea of avoiding the use of emissions reductions by more than one party. This was a really vital part of the puzzle. Um, often it's referred to as double counting, and it's the idea that if, if country one sells an emissions reduction to country two, in their accounting, just like in bookkeeping, you have to make sure that that trade is, is reflected. So when the country sells the emissions reduction, they have to make a what's called a corresponding adjustment to their emissions inventory to show that they no longer own that emissions reduction. And the other country that buys it has to, to do the corresponding thing on the other side. And what I've just, just highlighted there is that that it's mandatory, so it's a shall for, for all types of um, uses of, of these, these credits that you have to apply corresponding adjustments. And um, there's lots of other nuances and details. I'm obviously happy to take questions after this, but I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for a really great presentation. Um, lots of great information in your slides. Um, just as a reminder, um, if anyone would like to go back and look at Simon's slides or watch his presentation again, um, all the presentation materials, as well as helpful links, uh, the archived webcast, everything will be available online at www.eesi.org after the briefing today. So um, lots of great stuff in there. I'm sure everyone will want to go back and take a look. Um, I'm going to introduce our uh, next panelist, but I think we're going to move the order um, to accommodate something that's happening. Um, Nicole, I think I'm going to introduce you next um, so that you can um, deal with life's intervention. Um, Nicole Montclair Donaghy is a Hunkpapa Lakota from the Standing Rock Sioux Nation. She is also a descendant of the Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara Nations, and the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. Nicole is a seasoned land-based organizer who was, has worked on issues ranging from federal methane rules, fracking, radioactive waste, voting rights, voter mobility, and policy that affects Native American communities. Nicole is the executive director of North Dakota Native Vote. The focus of North Dakota Native Vote is to work on issues that affect the lives of citizens living on and off reservations. North Dakota Native Vote works to build power for Native communities of North Dakota. And uh, like the rest of our panelists, was at COP26. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspective about everything. Nicole, welcome to the briefing. Thank you, Dan. And I do apologize. I do have to hop off early. I have uh, a sick child waiting for me at his school. Uh, like Dan says, uh, I'm Nicole Montclair Donaghy. I'm the executive director of North Dakota Native Vote. Achante Washington Napechi Chiyuza Pelo. 
my relatives, hi, I shake, uh, my heart is happy to be here and I shake you warmly by the hands. Uh, so North Dakota Native Vote works to engage in tribe engage tribal members in constructing a representative democracy by working in reservation communities as well as urban areas. Uh, if you know the history of my people, the Standing Rock people, you would know that we are fierce protectors of our people, the land, the air, and the water. Uh, we also are not an oil and gas tribe, yet we are directly impacted by the oil and gas fracking that's happening in the northwestern part of our state. Um, and I'm sure you, when you think of Sandy Rock, I'm sure many of you think of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which has been routed 500 feet north of the northern border of our lands. I come from a place that is rooted, that is rooted in disparities that lie in historical experiences of oppression and exclusion. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I went to COP. Well, firstly, I was invited by a climate generation out of Minnesota to be an observer to the negotiations and to share my perspective as an indigenous organizer. My previous uh, position prior to coming to North Dakota Native Vote was a field organizer uh, counteracting the, the effects of oil and gas development in the Northwestern part of North Dakota, which is also known as the Bakken. As the Bakken. Um, from the work that I've done and everything that I've witnessed, I've come to the realization that fracking is a violent process that is directly correlated to not only pollution, but social issue, issues such as missing and murdered indigenous peoples, a rise in drug and alcohol use, murders, and destruction of the social fabric of our communities. The Bakken oil boom was another area was another era of land grab by the United States government and its ruling corporations. I wanted to be a part of this delegation because it is our initial instruction as Native American people to be good stewards of the land and protect life. Also, everything that I've experienced as an oil and gas organizer has shown me that the lack of inclusion in the decision-making processes that affect our everyday's, everyday lives is the root cause of the disparities that we face as communities. So one of the statistics that we've been talking about at COP uh, is that 5% of the world population is indigenous people, yet 80% of the world's diversity, biodiversity is protected by indigenous people and that's no, that's no mistake. We work for the protection of our communities to ensure that we have equitable representation at North Dakota Native Vote and that we have the ability to dictate the processes and the future of our own lives. Another reason why I wanted to, to attend was, uh, is because that we are often given a false choice that limits our selection to fossil fuels in our communities. When in my experience, it is the indigenous people of North Dakota that are leading the way to indigenize clean energy. And I've seen it happen in Turtle Mountain with Turtle Mountain, uh, the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewas Community College up there where the property manager has almost taken the uh, entire college off of the grid through his own uh, system that he's created and harnessed himself. We also have one of the largest uh, solar farms in North Dakota on my own reservation, just north of, of Cannonball. So my, you, you can go to the next slide. Uh, my experience um, at COP, despite being a badged observer, our own delegation had not observed an official session of the negotiations to contribute toward the rule book of the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. The United Kingdom's presidency and host of COP promised that this would be the most accessible COP ever. It was a promise that was too lofty in a time of overlapping crises, crises with the ongoing devastation of climate change with the ongoing climate chaos that we see here in our own state and also the devastation of COVID-19. Yes, we know that COVID-19 restricted and pre uh, created many obstacles that prevented many from attending this year. With that happening, I did question my own privilege um, attending each day while many of my relatives were not allowed and were not badged and stood outside the gates of COP26, standing in protest and in prayer and in song. My delegation with 
um, climate generation was myself, Ashley Fairbanks, and Kyle Hill, all indigenous people and all native to uh, the upper Midwest part of uh, Turtle Island. Along with our delegation and all of the indigenous people that were allowed to, that were allowed to be there, we collectively brought thousands of years of an ancestral knowledge, ceremony, song, tradition, as well as the certainty that our indigenous way of life is going to save the world. Sadly, the fossil fuel lab, the fossil fuel lobby, if they were if they were a country, uh, they would have been the largest delegation at COP. It, the fossil fuel lobby had. 503 delegates, two dozen more than the largest country delegation. Over 100 fossil fuel companies are represented at COP and 30 trade associations and membership, or membership organizations were also present. Going forward, uh, in my perspective, indigenous, indigenous voices must be included in the discourse of climate negotiations. Our ancestral knowledge has given us the instruction to protect all life, water, air, and on which we depend, and land on which we depend. We know that the earth cannot sustain the too big to fail model. We look to regenerative processes in order to leave a viable planet for our future generations by understanding that a life out of balance only brings chaos. Our worldviews as indigenous people are collective and intergenerational based on oral teachings and traditions with the responsibility of being a good relative to all. This knowledge is timeless and it cannot be encompassed or reflected in books. In order to establish, establish an equitable and just transition, it is imperative that the resources, that resources are shifted to frontline communities and to our tribal lands so that <clears throat> so that the solutions toward climate change are rooted in restorative, restorative practices and climate and racial justice. We cannot begin to build ourselves out of this global destruction and climate chaos without healing the lands and the communities that have been devastated and have been on the front lines of fossil fuel extraction. We also ask that the United States government also acknowledge free and prior and informed cons consent that it should be grounded in every aspect of policy decision making from the idea to implementation. Federal funding cannot, cannot focus on our tribal governments alone. We must invest and build capacity and employment within tribes to better understand how regenerative practices and business plans can work toward climate resiliency and how we can uh, apply funding into those programs. We also need to create access to technical assistance and improve outreach for federal funding opportunities. I work in the nonprofit world, and so I know that uh, the, the model is competitive and that um, it is our communities that are, always, um, that are always forgotten in the process. We also need to invest in clean jobs in Indian country. I've seen the model work. Uh, in Turtle Mountain and, Stan and Stanley Rock. I have a cohort of brothers that have indigenized solar energy here in North Dakota. And so I know the model of sustainability is, is real and it can work. We also must electrify and develop the public sector by implementing electric public transport and rooftop solar and wind. The United States federal government cannot begin to honor and live up to their federal trust responsibilities without providing the resources necessary for tribes to engage in a more, more re full realization of self-determination for all of our tribes. Lastly, uh, in my short uh, presentation here, we need to treat the climate crisis like the emergency it is. Our people are demanding action for our lives. And we understand that we must include the economy in the process, but the economy is not going to save our land, our air, and our water. We also understand that a model built for the world's largest polluters to incentivize carbon offset is not a model of sustainability. It's a model that has been built to maintain the status quo and to reaffirm the capitalistic conquests that have been destroying our lands for centuries. The Biden administration cannot truly talk about counteracting the effects of climate change while pipelines cross our lands and desecrate the land, air, and water. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for that uh, presentation today. And sh thank you very much for sharing your experiences. And also, thank you for sharing your experiences as COP was happening 
uh, with us. It helped um, helped us a great deal as we tried to keep track of everything that was going on. So I really appreciate it. I also understand that you have to leave us. I hope everyone's going to feel a little bit better. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I look forward to the next chance we have uh, to work together. Thank you. I do too. Have a good day, everyone. Um, uh, we are now going to turn to our next panelist, uh, Joanna Deplage. Dr. Joanna Deplage is a fellow of the Cambridge Center for Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Government Governance in the United Kingdom. She has been working on international climate change negotiations for 25 years in various roles, including with the UN Secretariat. Joanna, welcome to our briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for that introduction. Let me just try to share my screen. Yeah, so, so thank you very much, Dan, for that. And thank you also uh, to, to, to Simon and Nicole for some extremely informative and very powerful uh, presentations so far. It's been really great to hear all that. Um, and I'm, yeah, thank you to everyone for being here um, to listen. It's a real honor to be with you today to share my own uh, reflections on COP26 as someone who's been following this process for, for, for very many years, over, over two decades now. Um, now, this was really, I would say, a COP like no other, held under the extraordinarily difficult circumstances of a global pandemic, yet shouldering a very heavy burden of high expectations. And I think it's worth just reminding ourselves of some of the quite impassioned, almost apocalyptic claims uh, that were made about COP26 in the run up to the conference. But a more clear headed, maybe more thoughtful assessment of Glasgow might have been slightly less optimistic as to the likely outcomes. The context for, for Glasgow was, was uniquely challenging. I mean, the world was, still is, reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with all the massive economic and health impacts. And then logistically, uh, COVID posed huge obstacles to the smooth organisation of a COP with, in the end, um, 40,000 people who attended. Nicole already alluded to some of the uh, constraints faced. But it wasn't just COVID, uh, geopolitically, the rather frosty relations, if I can put it that way, between the US and China, the two largest emitters, um, and indeed between the UK and China, um, these, these rather tense situations certainly did not bode well to achieving very much in Glasgow. And Simon has already spoken about this, but it's worth uh, me emphasizing it. There are limits to what a COP can actually achieve uh, legally and politically, and this is often misunderstood. So COP decisions are there to um, establish collective goals, collective norms, rules, procedures to enable more effective action and cooperation among and by governments. But ultimately, it's the governments, it's private sector, it's the stakeholders. They're the ones who need to take the policy action to limit emissions. So the COP by itself never could save the world, as some of these statements we saw just now might have claimed this will depend on domestic implementation and follow through. Um, and Simon also mentioned again, it's really worth emphasizing this, the COP takes its decisions by consensus. That means with the agreement of all or almost all of the parties. And this requires compromise. So no country will achieve all of its negotiation goals. And this is something that uh, John Kerry recognized. I've included um, a quotation from him here. So in a sense, the stronger demands of the vulnerable developing countries of the environmental community, these were unlikely to ever make it through. But at the same time, the less ambitious countries will be called upon in the COP to move faster than they otherwise would. And I think it's very much what we saw in Glasgow. I mean, uh, speaking, speaking frankly and personally, COP did surpass my admittedly low expectations to achieve much more than I personally thought was possible. Um, I'm on record as saying that the UK would never manage to include a mention of coal in a COP decision, and, and yet this happens. And I think the outcome on the Paris rule book on Article 6 on transparency was certainly more rigorous than many had feared. Um, I'd just like to share some of the uh, big picture uh, positive developments that struck me. And let me 
just make the point here i am being deliberately optimistic i think optimism is the is is, is appropriate at this stage so i detected a surprisingly um constructive atmosphere at the cop i don't want to overstate this point national delegations fought their corner as vigorously as they as they ever do there were many tense moments but overall delegates negotiated with a can do a more business like attitude than perhaps we've seen in the recent past or in the history of the negotiations and it was reassuring to see that to a large extent government um yeah governments were able to set aside their wider political differences and kind of carve out a political space for cooperation on climate change and to some extent this reflects the increasingly strong global consensus over the urgency of action on climate change. And I completely agree with what Simon said about this. What we are seeing and what we saw in Glasgow was a cementing of 1.5 as the world's consensus temperature ceiling now, pivoting more strongly to 1.5 from the well below two that was in the Paris Agreement. So even Saudi Arabia, a very well-known obstructionist in these talks, they refer to 1.5 as a no-brainer. And this would have been completely unthinkable uh, two years ago. But then the emission cuts needed to level out temperature rise at 1.5 are much greater than for two. The slope of the emissions curve we need to achieve is much steeper, requiring um, more than a halving of global emissions from present levels by 2030 and in terms of action in terms of pledges we're we're nowhere near that yet but what we saw in glasgow as well as this pivot towards 1.5 was also greater recognition of the immediate emission cuts needed in this critical decade so i was really encouraged to see that the cover decision mentions 2030 seven times and the words critical decade three times. There's much more of a focus on the immediate, the short term cuts. Now, I'm convinced that this improved atmosphere that I detected reflects greater diplomatic engagement and commitment on the part of the United States over the past year. This undoubtedly made a huge difference to the relative success of COP26, especially if you compare it with the last COP in Madrid in 2019, which was which was hugely disappointing. It resulted in very few substantive outcomes and was really marred by bad tempered uh, exchanges. And this joint declaration by the US and China, uh, released in the second week on the, on the Wednesday, was universally welcomed as a very positive development. Now it's quite a vague, quite a general declaration, but the commitment of both countries to work together on climate change, despite their wider differences, was critical and very encouraging. And then it ended up having concrete results. The language that eventually sealed the deal on coal in the final decision, this phase down, that was taken directly from the declaration and China uh, insisted on this. So this very strong bilateral relationship that we see between China and the US on climate change has been absolutely critical uh, to progress to date. And let me very briefly highlight that this relationship is also personal here between uh, John Kerry and Xi Xuanhua, uh, the Chinese cl climate envoy, who have been working together for, for many years now. Uh, these things really matter in negotiations. Negotiations are personal uh, as much as they are uh, political. Now, moving away from the big picture towards the substance, there's a couple of outcomes I'd like to um, highlight. Like Simon, I was really encouraged to see that the Paris Agreement ratchet mechanism is starting to work, albeit unevenly. So out of the 193 parties to the Paris Agreement, all those shaded here, 150, 151, have submitted updates to their initial NDCs, their emission pledges. And the vast majority of these represent tangible, maybe not huge, but tangible improvements on the first set. Now, there are some notable exceptions, and these are the countries shaded in orange here. These are the ones that have submitted new or updated NDCs that are either no better or in some cases slightly worse than their first ones. So Australia, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Russia, Indonesia, um, these, these stand out and obviously 
more work is needed here. But in addition, ahead and then at uh, Glasgow, we've seen a wave, a real wave of announcements of net zero emissions by around mid-century. So something like 85% of the world's population is now covered by net zero targets. And I've listed here a few that declared just before or at uh, Glasgow. Now, I don't want to sound too optimistic. Many of these net zero targets are vague with little detail, no clear pathway for their achievement, but they are there and that really matters. And in many cases, they have been formally tabled to the UN Climate Secretariat, and this would have been unthinkable uh, two years ago. And let me just once again point out the central role of the US here. I doubt very much that most of these, if any of these countries, would themselves have declared for net zero if the US had not done so earlier this year. The exception, I would say, is China, which declared its net zero uh, targets uh, last year in 2020. Now, a really interesting development, and Simon mentioned this, is this sharpening focus on methane. Um, now, why is this important? Because methane is a very large contributor to global warming. It's more power, a more powerful greenhouse gas um, than carbon dioxide, and it is also short-lived. And what this means is that curbing methane emissions would have an outsized and immediate impact on temperature and this is very important now that we have now that we need to have uh, this new focus on very steep um, emission reductions by 2030. I mean I should say the methane has always been controlled uh, by the international climate change regime but what we're seeing now is a sharpening uh, focus on it. It's also relatively cheap and easy gas to tackle in certain sectors especially in terms of limiting leakage from oil and gas extraction. Um, Simon mentioned the Global Methane Pledge, which was actually sponsored by the US and the European Union, launched in fact in September, but acquired many more signatory in Glasgow, and methane is also mentioned in the cover decision. Now, another key message I got from COP26, and it might be an uncomfortable one, I admit this, is that the most advanced economies, uh, including Japan, the EU, UK, US, will need to do much more to support decarbonisation in the developing world and to help the most vulnerable adapt to climate change and to help them recover from climate damages that are happening right now. And a central dimension of this is public finance from the wealthier nations to the poorer ones. And there is a lot to do going forwards to belatedly meet this $100 billion goal uh, this was a target for funding that was agreed in 2009 to achieve $100 billion in funding per year by 2020, which, which has been missed, got close to it, but it's been missed. The parties need to negotiate a new collective finance goal for 2025 and to negotiate um, some funding arrangements for loss and damage for recovering from climate impacts through a new dialogue that COP26 set up. This is a very heavy agenda of work on finance, but it is absolutely critical. It's really, really important politically, and it should be seen not as a question of charity, but actually of solidarity and enlightened self-interest. Now, another side of the coin here is that in Glasgow, we saw a move to end public support for fossil fuels abroad. There was a declaration on this in Glasgow at the UK's initiative that was signed by uh, more than 40 countries and development banks. And this would see a halt to overseas funding for unabated fossil fuels uh, next year, except in very specific circumstances. So if that development aid that was previously going towards uh, fossil fuels, if that's going to be choked off, then this opens up opportunities to redirect it towards cleaner energy. And in this space on finance, I would also highlight this deal, $8.5 billion deal to help South Africa transition away from coal, uh, which was announced in Glasgow. And it's certainly no coincidence that South Africa has put forward a particularly ambitious update to its NDC. And these kind of bespoke targeted financial settlements will become increasingly important, I would say, in boosting the low carbon transition and trust.
within developing countries. Uh, so looking beyond public finance, there are also the market mechanisms that have been set up under Article 6, which Simon mentioned, and these provide really important new opportunities for the private sector to invest in low carbon projects overseas, also helping to transfer technology and know-how. Now, of course, the US couldn't take part in the predecessor in the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol because it wasn't a party to that treaty. Uh, but now there's an opportunity for the private sector to catch up, to make up for this and to engage with the Paris Agreement mechanisms. So in summary, Glasgow, in my view, did score some significant wins, uh, but it's now up to governments and stakeholders to really deliver and build on these. And it's very important that as the media spotlight shifts to other events going on in the world, that the pledges and promises made in Glasgow are not just forgotten. There's a long list of tasks, tasks ahead going forwards to uh, COP27 in Egypt and beyond. Uh, finance certainly takes centre stage here, but there's also the imperative of encouraging countries whose 2030 emission targets are still quite weak to encourage them to revisit these by 2022 as requested by the COP. And added to that, it'll be really critical to lock in and build on the various declarations that were made in Glasgow, including the methane pledge, including on ending international fossil fuel financing and deforestation is another one, and there are more. And here, there will be a really critical role to play for the UK COP presidency, which actually continues uh, through to COP27 in 2022, and also for US diplomacy. And then one last point, and I can't stress this enough, this uh, diplomacy, this leadership must be founded on strong climate policy domestically. It's only really through robust, robust action at home that the UK and the US can have the credibility and the authority on the international stage to push others to do more. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, for that great presentation. And as a reminder, slides are available online at www.esi.org. Also, as a reminder for people following us online, and there are many, um, you can ask us questions. You can do that in two ways. One is by sending us an email. Uh, the email address to use is askask at eesi.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at eesi online, and we're getting a couple and um, we're working to incorporate those into the Q&A. Um, our final panelist today is Ann Kelly. Ann is the Vice President of Government Relations at Ceres, a nonprofit sustainability organization that mobilizes investor and business leadership to build a more sustainable global economy. Ann also directs uh, Business for Innovative Climate and Energy Policy, or BICEP, a coalition of 52 leading companies, including Mars, L'Oreal, and DF Corporation, advocating for meaningful climate and energy policy at the federal and state levels. She is actively engaged on Capitol Hill on behalf of Ceres, as well as BICEP member companies. And welcome to our briefing today. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan, for that introduction. And thanks to Simon and Nicole and Joanna. Those are three superb, rich uh, uh, presentations that I can very, very briefly build upon in my remarks. And of course, anxious to get to your questions and our discussion. So I've been asked just to comment on the business response to the COP and the business view, and I'm gonna to try to do so by keeping the title of this session in mind, which is what Congress needs to know uh, going forward, because as all three speakers have allowed, the, the current, what's most important now is, is what we do from here. I appreciate the context given um, by uh, Simon and Joanna about this COP in particular, and I too wanted to offer as I approach the topic, you know, put put this in context, which has already been noted, but I want to highlight that from a business perspective, the US being back in. Uh, was profound and very, very different from the last uh, three COPs that we experienced. So the US being back sends a signal. And I think the way that businesses look at something like this is essentially businesses and investors and series represents both. What are the signals that we're getting? What are the economic signals? What is the direction of travel? And to have an administration that says we are back in, we are all in, to have an administration that favors rule making over rule breaking sends a critical 
economic signal. And that may be why so many businesses, despite travel restrictions and COVID restrictions and limited travel budgets, elected to show up, show up in person and many, many more on Zoom. So don't want to, we cannot overstate the importance of the US having an active role and the message that sends to the overall business community about the importance of climate action and therefore likely climate rules and regulations coming forward um, in the near future. So fundamentally important. Let me say that business is not a monolith, which you already know. And when I say it's, it's important to think about the business community as representing a vast spectrum from real leaders to real detractors uh, on the, just the two blunt ends of the spectrum there. Uh, all of you know that the fossil fuel sector was the largest sector represented and, and larger than any country uh, delegation. Uh, that's unfortunate. I would put the fossil fuel sector in the detractor category. I'm going to leave it at that. Series represents business leaders, those who are setting science-based targets, those who are really seeking um, to see the Paris Agreement uh, become successful and to keep us at 1.5. Our interaction with uh, fossil fuel companies is largely through pressure imposed by our investor allies. So I, I will leave it at that. And I'm going to focus on what we can look at when we think about the business leaders. And there I want to point to an important letter that was sent and signed by over 700 companies before the COP that was sent to all of the G20. And those companies uh, span the world, about 200 in the US, around 7 trillion total in, in revenue. And they were calling for stronger targets for a phase out, and I do mean phase out of coal, for an end, period end to fossil fuel subsidies and for mandatory climate risk disclosure. Now, I can tell you that was the first to see that number of companies ahead of time, up to two months ahead of time, calling on the G20, really putting forward what they were looking for um, was significant. So of course, the fact that as, as previous speakers have noted, the fact that we have a phase down, granted it's phase down of coal and an end to inefficient fossil fuel subsidies is of course notable and will be recognized by the business community. And, and again, I think signals the correct direction of travel. I can't help but quote, um, my friend Jennifer Morgan of Greenpeace, who in talking about the final result, said it's meek, it's weak, and the 1.5 Celsius goal is only just alive, but a signal has been sent that the era of coal is ending. And I think it's that signal that, again, the business community looks narrowly at what is the signal, what, what is the direction of travel, and in that way, again, you know, very positive. To get a little more specific, I just want to comment on the methane pledge, which lines up beautifully with the methane rules that the administration dropped, as you know, just at the start of COP. Uh, we, among others, are mobilizing investor and business support for those methane rules, which are of the utmost importance in two parts, part one uh, deadline mid-January, part two coming out in the spring. It also really lines up nicely with the current uh, methane reduction program that is part of the Build Back Better package. So there's a real synergy and it leads to a real consensus and therefore increased support for methane reduction all around. So that, that was really important. We also hosted a session at the COP around deforestation uh, with Senator Schatz, which sets the stage beautifully for the filing of his bill. And of course, the consensus to fight deforestation is of great interest to those leading companies that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I think what Congress needs to know is to expect further business support around two of those critical areas that came up at the COP, um, and, we, and we should look for that. Um, I think I also wanted to highlight that we hosted a congressional delegation, which had seven senators and 30 major companies. And these are, of course, off the record sessions. But there was real candid discussion there. And I was so thrilled to hear so many business leaders talking to these seven senators from across the country. They happen to all be Democrats. But the companies were clearly saying we support a price on carbon, we support this direction of travel, we supported the NDC in 2030, 411 companies came out for the interim target, the, the 2030 target last April, to say we want to see this strong target sent. And again, that was the first time that collection of businesses actually got fully engaged in an NDC, and I look forward to their continued involvement as we continue the ratchet mechanism and, and see how effective it can be. One of the leaders in that CODEL and the congressional delegation said that he had never seen this much positive business support 
at a cop. And this is a veteran of the process who's been to many, many cops. And I was struck by his perception of what he was seeing and what he was hearing um, throughout the time that he was there. So we see that as very positive. And that brings us to the critical moment um, which we find ourselves in right now. And that is the desire to pass the reconciliation package and the build back better package well how does that link to cop 26 well of course the linkage is that the u.s showed up made pledges both formally and informally that the u.s will lead that we are all in and that we are going to keep our promises and so that increases the pressure uh, and the excitement frankly around actually passing the build back better package given the strength of the climate commitments there and you can count on the business community getting behind that package and making a compelling economic case for action, especially when compared to inaction. And we heard so much over the COP about the consequences of inaction. And, and I take Nicole's comments very seriously. I think we have to take the comments of Greta and Vanessa very seriously, despite our optimism. They're asking us to help them. Vanessa kept saying over and over, prove us wrong. Um, we've got to think about our optimism in the context of, of those who are suffering immediately, obviously, and, and those who are under the age of 25. So I would count on looking for companies to come forward, make the economic case, investors making the, um, the economic case. I think you know, COP27 also um, increases the pressure companies feel from their younger employees, from their customers. News out today from the Yale Office of Communications that the number has never been higher of Americans who are concerned or deeply concerned about climate change. All of these affect especially consumer brands who are really see themselves and part of their license to operate is being active on climate. That's why 395 companies in the US have a plan to set have set science based targets 207 of those have been approved there are all kinds of commitments that are kind of on the sidelines that came around the cop but that are perfectly timed to demonstrate a corporate individual action that i think we're going to continue to see forward going forward we're seeing records amounts of purchasing of renewable energy i think it's important for members of congress to pay attention to that um, and also the one of the reasons companies are so excited about the investments in the Build Back Better package is the way in which it will support this renewable energy sector that they themselves are so ready, willing, and able to invest in. Having the government support that is, is of the utmost importance. I, I liked uh, one of the quotes that Joanna had in her slide is really worth our remembering, which is the quote from John Kerry, that in a good negotiation, all parties are uncomfortable. I think we're all pretty uncomfortable right now with the Build Back Better package and the compromises that have been made. And perhaps that's a good thing. Perhaps that means that we have really zeroed in on an appropriate uh, bipartisan compromise, um, including with the methane reduction program that's built into it. So we're certainly looking for that passage and i think once we can get that through it, it makes us easy it makes it easier for the us to hold its head up high in global negotiations like the cop and to have it pass just weeks after returning from glasgow i think will be an important statement um, for the us so we look forward to making sure that that happens and at this point i'm looking forward to your questions and our discussion thanks dan absolutely and thank you so much um, I am going to invite Simon and Joanna to turn their uh, videos back on and um, to help us navigate our question and answer session, I would like to introduce my colleague, Anna McGinn, our policy manager. You may remember Anna for such briefings as Momentum on Climate Adaptation and the Negotiations, What's on the Table. Um, she's been featured in lots of these briefings because she's such a huge part of our COP26 coverage. Anna, turn it over to you for uh, the start of the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Dan. Excited to be here. Um, so we're going to just jump right in. Um, we've got lots of questions, both coming from the audience and ones we're excited to ask from EESI as well. So um, the first question I want to get to is obviously COP26 has been in the news, um, of course, throughout the COP um, and then lots of headlines uh, following the COP and trying to kind of sort out what's happened. So I'm curious if you could, and to some extent, some of you have done this already in your presentations, but I think there's lots to choose from. So I think we can still dive into this. Um, what have been um, some things you've been hearing about COP26 in the news that you think maybe don't get it quite right, that you could give us maybe a quick 
deep dive into here. Um, kind of clear that up for us. And we've also got a question from the audience, um, I think mostly directed to you, Simon, on how journalists are able to deal with the challenges of access within the COP and kind of understanding what's going on in the negotiations in real time, not only, you know, access to the rooms, but just the sheer amount of things happening at once. Um, how do you kind of keep track of all of that and try to report on it as accurately as possible? So. Um, maybe we can go in the order of presentation. So we'll start with you, Simon, go to Joanna, and then um, go to Anne. Yeah, so um, I, mean, I, I think the, you know, the, the biggest thing that was um, probably not reported as well as it could have been was this coal fight. I, you know, I already touched on that, um, and I'm kind of conscious of time. Um, so I'd probably just focus maybe on the second question. Um, so obviously, particularly this COP, I don't know about how others experienced it, but my my feeling was that it was, I mean, COP's always a bit overwhelming, um, but this this time around was was particularly, you know, it was like a deluge of announcements coming from all directions at all times. And on top of that, the COP venue itself was quite cramped. There were also record numbers of attend, you know, registered delegates, and it just kind of felt quite claustrophobic, and, and it was... So it was, you know, particularly tough to to keep up with what was going on. I mean, in terms of trying to get a sense of, you know, you know, accurate reporting, keeping track of the negotiations, you know, that basically that relies on, you know, sources, you know, the standard journalistic thing. So that might be negotiators that you know that you get to know, or it might be, you know, subject experts um, that work with, you know, observer organisations, civil society NGOs, and so on. Um, and then, you know, actually, I think one of the underrated approaches is actually just to read the draft negotiating texts, because a lot of people don't do that. And although it is written in a slightly strange UN speak, and it, you know, is often a kind of a mess of brackets, you can actually get a pretty good sense of where the fights are just by looking at those. Thanks, Joanna, we'll jump to you. Yeah, and, and, and building on that, can I just pay tribute to Simon, who really did do some incredible analysis of these negotiating texts within minutes of them coming out. And I think the entire climate change community is grateful to you, Simon, uh, for doing that. Uh, I wasn't a journalist, but I, I do just want to point out that the UK government was uh, choreographing um, the media announcements very, very carefully. This is a presidency that more than any other certainly wanted to spin uh, the various outcomes they got a favorable um reception in the media i'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing but that's certainly something to to highlight so talking about the media i think that, that there were two um two stories really that i slightly raised my eyebrows at one was this claim at the beginning that china was not represented uh, because xi jinping did not make the journey to uh to glasgow and it was not often mentioned that Xi Jinping has not left China since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was very unlikely that he would come to Glasgow. And certainly his the fact that he wasn't there making a speech had absolutely no bearing whatsoever on China's participation. China participated extremely actively. Uh, the second thing I would say was this portrayal of India as a kind of villain in a way. And I think not just in the coal fight at the end, but also at the beginning, there were some really quite strange stories when India announced its net zero by 2070 target, sort of implying that this was somehow a very retrograde step, that 2070 uh, was extremely late, without really pointing out that India's emissions per person are absolutely tiny. They are less than half the global average, and they're, what, one-eighth of those of the US. So there's no way that India could be expected to take on the 2050 net zero target. And that was a bit disappointing that some really quite senior journalists didn't really put that um, into context. And in terms of the coal fight, as, as Simon puts it, it wasn't just India that was wary of signing up to a phase out of coal. I mean, it was also China, it was Nigeria, uh, it was South Africa, and these are perfectly legitimate concerns for these developing countries to have and even agreeing phase down was an absolutely massive win but I would say overall the level of media coverage that COP26 enjoyed was absolutely incredible and from all around the world from what I could from what I could gather and, and that can only be a really good thing and in general 
the quality of coverage was absolutely superb, I would say, in general, notwithstanding those two little hiccups that I mentioned. Oh, Anne, you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm just enthusiastically agreeing with Joanna about the quality and the quantity of the press. I have not seen anything like it before, really. So many people mentioning it all over, you know, all sorts of news outlets that wouldn't normally cover it in this in this amount of detail. So I am loath to criticize any journalist who was trying to cover this, especially under the conditions that Simon was describing. But I guess building a little bit on Joanna's comment there, I think, you know, there is a little bit of a tendency to diss uh, India and China, the why aren't India and China, without putting this but without putting it in context of who these people are in these countries about the massive contribution of the u.s to the problem also the per capita the per capita contribution of the u.s versus your average chinese person or your average indian person you really have to fully embrace our contribution and also when we think about china and india we have to realize that their emissions are going up because they're making our stuff we have offshored manufacturing years ago. And so, yes, their emissions are going up. If we onshored and we manufacture things here, we're likely to take some of that responsibility back on. I think that's one story I would have loved to see folks dig into a little more. The only second story is on fossil fuel subsidies that I'm always looking for comparative analysis uh, to, to I love John Kerry's quote, you know, that the continuation of fossil fuel subsidies is the definition of insanity. I just like to see that compared to uh, the renewable energy sector, because much of the Build Back Better bill will, of course, help to subsidize through tax credits, the clean energy sector, and just for us to fully embrace the inequities in terms of what we how we have subsidized this fossil fuel sector for so long versus the poultry amounts that we've given to the renewable energy sector. I love to see those comparisons. But other than that, no, the press did a fine job. Thanks so much. Okay, so our next question jumps into what happens next now that the Paris rule book has finally been finalized. Um, so what uh, kind of changes for the UNFCCC process now that this finalization has happened? And I, one of you mentioned sort of an inflection point and growing pains between the rulemaking body and the implementation. So I would love um, any additional thoughts on that? And then for our audience, which is mostly practitioners, either on the Hill and federal agencies, working communities across the US, can you share some changes that they might see, if any, because this rule book is finalized, any opportunities that might open up or new reporting requirements that um, they might come across in their work? Um, why don't we maybe start with Joanna this time, and then we'll go to Anne and we'll wrap up with Simon. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a very interesting uh, question. And I, I think it will certainly take, um, you know, a few months to really get a handle on what all this means um, internationally. It will certainly mean a huge uplift in reporting on the part of countries in reporting um, more frequently and reporting um, in much greater detail. And that's especially the case for developing countries, because we have to remember that in the developed world, so including the US, we have been reporting our emissions data uh, annually since 1994 and then periodically on our policies. So in a sense that the real difference is actually applies to developing countries rather than developed worlds, a real uplift for them. But that does involve, you know, over 150 countries. So this will mean a huge um, influx of new data and of new information about adaptation needs as well and about policies. And I think shining a light on what's actually happening in the developing world, I think will be really interesting because there's a lot more happening than developing countries are often given credit for. What it will also need, though, is uh, capacity building to enable this reporting. You know, it's not always easy uh, to get your hands on your own national emissions data. There will be capacity building going on. Uh, there will be funding going on, all kinds of support. That's really important. And obviously, the second arm to that are the uh, Article 6 mechanisms where yes we finalized the rule book that's true but there's still more work to go before the first projects can actually start to be implemented there's a supervisory committee that needs to be set up there are methodologies that need to be agreed there's a whole bunch of stuff but hopefully now that all that has been agreed it would all be gradually pushed through and i think you know right now right now private sector companies can start to think about you know partnering with uh, 
people in you know in Brazil, in Nigeria, wherever, and start to look out for those um, those promising projects. In a way, I say there's a lot to do, but from what I see, a lot of the Article Six mechanisms are basically going to replicate what we already have under the Clean Development Mechanism, but under new names, and which I think is really good with more safeguards. So I'm sure if Nicole was here, she'd be pointing out the safeguards for indigenous peoples to, to guard against land grabs. Um, there's um, there's all kinds of mechanisms in place for making complaints, for making appeals. So it's a much strengthened system, but it is an expanded system, and it certainly does present um, a lot of opportunities, which hopefully I'm sure Anne's members would already have been thinking about this. Yeah, this is our hope is that our members are in fact thinking about this and thinking about ways in which they can remember that many of them have extended supply chains in the developing world, which I just alluded to and that they will, in terms of the reporting requirements that they'll feel some responsibility. Um, that they'll want to be tracking in a, in a closer way. Well, where what is happening in these countries? We have this expanded reach. We are multinationals and that they will feel some responsibility and some need for partnership in the developing world as, as countries are forced to are asked to give us much more data on, on how is it going. So it isn't going to be enough to measure your greenhouse gas footprint and what you're doing in the US. It's, it's much, much, it's just a much greater responsibility. So, so I'm excited about that. I think it's a positive outcome. Thanks. Um, and just very briefly to say, I'm, I'm going to have to shoot off after this question to pick up my daughter from nursery. Um, so I'll keep this brief. Um, just just uh, a couple of things. Um, for, first of all, you know, we've got this, this really important process next year with the request for countries to revisit and strengthen their climate pledges. We've already seen just in you know, kind of a matter of hours almost after the gavel came down in Glasgow, um, Australia saying that they wouldn't increase their 2030 pledge having already failed to, to do that um, um but also in the in the glasgow climate pact there, there was a um, a process which means that this this really important question of pre-2030 ambition so increasing emissions cuts in the next nine years that's going to be like a standing uh, a standing item on the agenda at the next cop and you know and beyond so it's not going away, and the diplomatic pressure that those you know those countries, the laggards that are you know failing to pull up their socks, they you know that's that's also not going away. So that's going to be really interesting to watch. Obviously, by the end of 2022, it means that countries can turn up in COP27 without having done that. Um, but I'm sure there'll be you know huge huge push to to get that to, you know get that going before we arrive in Egypt. Um, just the other thing that's that's I think is quite interesting, bit of a grey area on Article Six, is this this kind of interlinkage. If you know whether there's an interlinkage with the voluntary carbon market, so you know corporates buying offsets in order to meet their own their own emissions pledges. Now there was an at one stage there was a draft that 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 made a very clear linkage to the voluntary carbon markets, um, but that isn't there in the final text. So it's still not totally clear how that how that's going to work. I think you know that there's there's this sort of expe expectation that's been set that that corporates buying offsets under this mechanism, if if they're allowed to do that, would have to kind of make the corresponding adjustments to avoid double counting. But but that isn't set in stone, and you know I think there's a bit of dust to settle on on exactly how that's going to work. Thank you, Simon. And I know you have to run. Um, Dealing with time changes, um, whether it was Anna or Emma or Savannah, less me, very difficult to get our heads around the time differences, especially when everything changes halfway through with the daylight savings ending. But Simon, before you take off, I have one more question for Anne and Joanna, but before you take off, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, Joanna and Anne, the last question that I kind of wanted to leave with is, so, uh, and I was scolded a little bit earlier today by referring to this as downtime, but we are in fact in between COPs. And while everybody's going to be working very hard getting ready for COP27, it's not gonna happen for another 11 months or so. And I was curious, and Anne, maybe we'll start with you this time, um, sort of what do you see happening between, um, are there things that you're gonna be watching for that will either give you a good feeling about COP27 or maybe make you a little sort of concerned about maybe where progress is headed? What are you gonna be watching out for between now and when world leaders convene in Egypt next year? 
Yeah, thanks for that question, Dan. I mean, first and foremost, um, I'm looking out for the passage of our reconciliation bill, which is just a way of saying that this is going to, you know, this is something really important to show the U.S. is serious about its NDC. We simply have to get this package through. So we're looking out for both the passage of it and the implementation of this package, as well as the bipartisan infrastructure package that just went through the the historic investment in electric vehicles, the historic investment in, in rail, um, the historic investment in resilience. So it's a way in which the US can walk the talk and ideally inspire other industrialized nations accordingly. So we have to both pass them, then we have to track and market our successes and the ways in which they're working and their cost effectiveness. Believe it or not, I'm also looking to hope that the price on the carbon pricing conversation gets more developed and that we get closer to a potential uh, bipartisan agreement on one of two things, either a carbon price or going back to the clean energy performance program. And that was dropped out of the Build Back Better bill, but there may be a, a possibility of picking up the pieces and revisiting that again in a bipartisan way, which is always our preference and would be much more durable. And I think send again an important global signal. Finally, I'm looking for the US to keep its promises into the environmental justice community and to the community that uh, Nicole represents. There have been a number of promises made by the Biden administration. I take them very seriously about really looking out for vulnerable communities in a way that no other administration has. We need to make progress there as we model as a nation what the globe needs to do in terms of really looking to support those who have borne a disproportionate burden of climate change and environmental impact and really care for them, listen to their interests um, in, a, in a serious way in hopes that happens on the global stage as well. Joanna, I think this means you get the last word. Oh, I always like to have this last word. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a very well-defined agenda going towards um, Egypt. There's a whole bunch of, of workshops, of talks, of, of sessions that, that, that need to happen. I, I wanted to flag um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, will be releasing the second and third parts of its sixth assessment report, so on mitigation and impacts and adaptation. And that will also be you know, a very important moment um, to track where we are in terms of climate change impacts and what we can actually do to address the problem. But I think what I would do, what I really want to do actually, would have a joint last word with Anne in the sense that this period now has to be about meeting promises. Meeting promises, that is absolutely critical. It's, it, it's about meeting promises on finance, about actually meeting the $100 billion goal and exceeding it. And it's about meeting promises on mitigation. And I'm afraid the entire 30 year history of the climate change regime, despite real progress, it's been littered with broken promises. And, and, I, and I feel sad to have to say this present company, but most of, have, most of those have been broken by the US. And if the US can pass these bills that Anne is talking about and can make stronger and deliver the money, that, that the 11 billion that have been promised, and make more financial pledges, that will make all the difference. That will really unlock the global response to climate change yeah so let's all go home to our countries to our communities let's all implement on the ground it's about meeting promises internationally and taking action domestically i cannot emphasize that more well thank you joanna and that's what this briefing series has been all about um, because the people who are in charge of those uh following through on those promises um um, are, are really important uh, and we have to make sure that they have all the educational resources that they have. Um, I would like to say special thanks to you and Anne for joining us today in Abstentia. Thanks also to Nicole and Simon for joining us. An excellent conversation. Anna, thank you for leading us through a great Q&A, um, a really cool and um, informative conclusion to our five-part briefing series all about Congress and COP26. Um, I would like to also acknowledge everyone, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who have attended our briefings over the last few weeks and have subscribed to our daily newsletters and have downloaded our fact sheets and issue briefs um, and have read our media coverage, our coverage in the media. Uh, uh, thank you so much for taking advantage of all of our resources. Um, we will put up some slides in just a moment and one of those slides will be a survey slide. We'll get to that in just a second, um, but take, um, take a moment and fill that out when we get there. Um, before I describe what's on the screen right now, I would just like to um, acknowledge once again that this briefing series would not have been possible without our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington, 
and not without our partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Thank you so much for your generous support. Um, we will continue to cover COP26 in written materials. Of course, um, we had uh, a series of briefings we covered in, in great depth, many of the topics that were discussed today, including climate adaptation and climate finance. We also kicked off with the October 8th briefing with Sir Robert Watson and Christiana Figueres talking about creating policies, coalitions, and actions for global sustainable development and the Making Peace with Nature report that came out earlier this year. Um, if you want to check any of those out, and I really encourage you if you've missed any of them, be sure to visit us online at www.eesi.org. Um, but uh, we also have been posting um, additional resources online as well. Um, uh, the written materials, for example, three online trackers that have kept track of things that we followed very closely during COP26, congressional engagement at COP26, as well as um, the announcements that were made and the reports that were released. So those are also available online as well. Um, and um, I think those three in particular are especially unique resources, and I, I haven't seen a lot of um, similar um, uh, resources, so please take advantage of those. Our next briefing series, we're going to turn a bit of a corner um, and we're going to look at um, issues around waste in our brief, uh, December briefing mini series, Reduce and Reuse. Uh, we will have three briefings. The first is um, December 8th, Building Materials from Production to Reuse. The second, December 9th, The Climate Consequences of Plastics. Uh, and December 10th, Reducing Emissions by Reducing Food Waste. Um, if you have not yet RSVP'd for these briefings, um, you can do so. There's the link. You can also just uh, Google us. Um, you can visit us, um, our homepage, www.esi.org. Um, or best of all, you can sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. It's the greatest way, really the best way to keep track of everything that we're up to today. Um, this is the survey link I mentioned a minute ago. Um, we really value every bit of feedback. We read every response. If you have two minutes, and you can let us know how we did today or how we did during the whole briefing series. We'd really, really appreciate that. Did you have any tech issues? Um, did you have any issues um, navigating the website? Did you um, have comments uh, about speakers or topics or ideas for future coverage? We really do take every bit of feedback we get very seriously. Um, I also like to thank um, a lot of hard work across the EESI um, over the last uh, weeks and months. Um, special thanks to Dan O'Brien and Anne-Marie uh, for all the help with the briefing. Special thanks to Anna, Emma, Savannah for all the help um, and tremendous hard work during um, the uh, COP26 itself and um, all of the lead up to the briefings. Special thanks to Amber for keeping everything else on track. Um, everyone contributes to these briefings at EESI, .org, um, at EESI, even though maybe I'm the one who shows up on the webcast more frequently, by no means do I do all of the work. Um, it's really done by a, a really talented and um, devoted team of professionals. Also like to thank um, Isabella, Valerie, and Roshni. There are three interns, future climate professionals, and they make everything that we do possible. So thanks very much to them. We will go ahead and end it there, uh, maybe a minute early. Thanks to everyone who joined us today online. And if you um, um, want to find anything more um, about our briefings, again, visit us online. But we'll see you in December for Reduce and Reuse our waste mini series. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your Thursday.